this is an issue. Like I, I don't just go on the offense against MLs because it's fun or something. It's because these sort of situations happen. People get disappeared. People's rights are curtailed. So one of Naomi's friends asked me to talk about this because this is a big story that Western media has not picked up. So if you don't know who Naomi Wu is, Naomi Wu is arguably the largest Chinese tech influencer in the English speaking world. And about to, a month ago, maybe two now, she completely disappeared from the internet because the government started cracking down. It's important to note that this comes in the wake of Chinese crackdowns on the LGBT community. Recently, the Chinese Center for LGBT People in Beijing was forcibly shuttered by the Chinese government. And Naomi Wu is a lesbian. And not only is she a lesbian, but her partner is a Uyghur Muslim. So I'm gonna go over this. Naomi Wu and the silence that speaks volumes. When China's prodigious tech influencer Naomi Wu found herself silenced, it wasn't just the machinery of her surveillance state at play. From the bustling technological hub of Shenzhen, the pseudonymous Naomi Wu, who's also widely known as Sexy Cyborg, emerged as a striking embodiment of DIY tech prowess and authenticity. Her presence graced my Twitter feed for many years as an avatar of idealized femininity who preferred creative technical innovations, typically of her own creation, to a delighted Western audience, myself included. Wu, 29, is unquestionably an expert, despite frequent public suggestions from anonymous cowards suggesting her particular physical form disqualifies her from being one. In fact, I would personally classify her as a modern version of a renaissance woman given her unconventional style, lack of formal training, unique personality, and unusually wide range of interests and capabilities. So this is her. She has 1.6 million subscribers on YouTube. There's some lore here that I will go over. As an example, here she is comprehensively breaking down the capabilities of a high-tech filtration mask in a manner which is likely to be beyond your understanding. Okay, this is way too long. Wu's above video forced the mass seller, computer hardware manufacturer Razer, to issue a public response to her findings and to remove all references to N95 grade filter from their marketing material. Here's a 2017 video in which she develops a custom hacking drone called Screaming Fist. The last one I finally got it right, like this, and, uh, and then I... Uh... I printed the uh, other parts, I printed the other parts, but you know, like uh, most of my uh, process, I have to print tons of them. The Wu's technical acumen has always set her apart. And while yes, she also happens to be a beautiful woman, it was always her audacious authenticity alongside that unconventional cyberpunk aesthetic, which garnered immense respect. Through her creative content and generous engagement with followers across various social media platforms, she regularly shared glimpses of her life with her dogs and partner, all slipstream alongside deeply technical DIY content, her hallmark. Naomi's partner, Katie, belongs to the Uyghur minority, further heightening the vulnerability of their situation. So here's one of her tweets back in May. I'm okay. Katie's family likes me. Her mom put out a huge traditional Uyghur spread. I'm so full. That's really sweet. Wu has served as a kind of cultural ambassador for individuals like me, offering insight into authentic Chinese perspectives. But it is precisely her open embrace of the world, facilitated by global social media, that appears to have ultimately made Wu more vulnerable to state pressures. The way she managed the balance of championing her personal beliefs while circumventing overt criticism of her home country was nothing short of an art form. Wu's role in the hardware hacking scene has been pivotal in challenging stereotypes about who belongs in the tech world. Her presence confidently occupies the space she's carved out, one where authenticity and expertise are the primary criteria for recognition. However, her relatability might have exposed her to additional risks. Despite the challenges she faces at home, her success as a major tech influencer on the global stage seems to have placed her within her government sites. Despite her primarily Western audience, Wu has consistently encountered unfavorable treatment from Western media, often tinged with misogyny. 
Notably, a Vice magazine reporter appeared to consider outing Wu without her consent, potentially jeopardizing her safety by revealing personal information. In a separate troubling incident, the founder of Make Magazine was compelled to issue a public apology after insinuating that Wu wasn't a real human, a baffling assertion considering her substantial and well-documented contributions on YouTube. So this is the last tweet she's ever done. And let me start reading from the article. Naomi Wu's devastating July 7 tweet alluded to a pressure that had long been feared by many, yet optimistically hoped she could manage to avoid indefinitely. And the tweet reads as followed, on July 8th, 2023. Okay, for those of you who haven't figured it out yet, I got my wings clipped and they weren't gentle about it. So there's not going to be much posting on social media anymore and only on very specific subjects. I can leave, but Katie can't. So we're just going to follow the new rules. And that's that. Nothing personal if I don't like and reply like I used to. I'll be focusing on the store and the occasional video. Thanks for understanding. It was fun while it lasted. Although this was not the first instance of Chinese authorities scrutinizing the tech expert, similar occurrence transpired in 2019. The most disconcerting element of this incident lies in the conspicuous lack of media coverage, a perplexing omission given Wu's standing as an emblem within the DIY maker communities and her prior media exposure. Conversely, a recent hoax originating from a social media account belonging to a child influencer Lil Tay claimed she and her brother had died and generated a rapid flurry of coverage. Could these be geopolitical hesitations standing in the way, or merely some unfortunate oversight amidst the relentless news churn on the part of those outlets who previously covered her? The tech media's relative silence in the face of Wu's abrupt disconnection illuminates a disconcerting landscape of media acquiescence. The omission of her predicament by the media isn't just an oversight. It's a signal suggesting that a significant portion of Western media may be increasingly compromised by Beijing's influence, finding themselves unable to criticize foreign policy lest they rile the tiger and negatively impact their business. A key reason influencers like Wu are able to gain traction is because of the validation they receive from the public and media alike. Silence in such distressing situations can easily be misinterpreted as indifference. Furthermore, when cultural ambassadors like Wu find themselves precipitously exiled from public life, it sends a cautionary tale to those who might have once been emboldened to share their own stories. I saw the people saying, like, I wish Hassan would cover it. Hassan would never cover this because he would immediately start catching flack from people such as Hakeem and Second Thought and Ugopnik and the rest of the deprogram pod crowd, which he's sucking up to quite a bit. This is an issue. Like, I... I don't just go on the offense against MLs because it's fun or something. It's because these sort of situations happen. People get disappeared. People's rights are curtailed. I'm going to get into this article talking about how right now in China, they are cracking down on LGBT activists. They're making it harder to be an openly gay and an openly trans person in China. These conditions are exacerbated by an apparent and ever-tightening grip on information from inside China. And amidst these macro concerns lies an added poignant truth about representation and freedom of expression. Naomi Wu is not just a tech virtuoso. She's a living embodiment of resilience for a global LGBT community, which is navigating increasingly restrictive terrains. Wu's pullback from the public gaze not only deprives the tech world of an icon, it also robs Wu's wider community of a valuable symbol of tenacity, hope, and self-love in the face of repressive state control. The relentless surveillance and censorship tactics utilized by the Chinese Communist Party are not unfamiliar to the global audience. The tragic predicament of the Uyghurs, a cultural and ethnic Chinese minority subjected to what many have called genocide, stands testament to the CCP's intent to tightly control the cultural viewpoints of its population by any means they consider necessary, even if brutal. Given these precedents, there is a growing apprehension that Wu's digital silence signals a new chapter in China's human rights transgressions, one in which the LGBTQ community potentially emerges as the newest target of state-led oppression in keeping with global trends. Yin Jing, Beijing's LGBT center's executive director provided the statistic that only 5% of Chinese people identifying as LGBTIQ are out to their families, with an added 0.1% reporting being out in their professional lives as well. 
Outright International statement reads as below. The LGBT community in China has experienced a period of tremendous change. Over the course of the past several decades, LGBT people have gone from being nearly invisible in Chinese society to forming a vibrant social movement. Progress has been promising, but remains precarious. Discrimination and state repression are still pervasive, and advocates must navigate treacherous and ever-changing political waters. Strings of news celebrating progress, a court ruling against a clinic offering so-called conversion therapy, a campaign going viral, are punctuated by setbacks, the police detaining activists and shutting down events, censors removing online content, and policymakers snubbing calls for equality. Developments have been rapid and full of twists and turns. One of the latest turns is the Beijing LGBT Center's closure by the Chinese government in May of this year. This move came even after the center took the preemptive step of changing its name to minimize its association with sexual minorities, underscoring the length to which such organizations must go to an adapt to an increasingly restrictive environment. So here was a statement on Twitter. The Beijing LGBT Center announced its closure today. Founded in 2008, the center was a vibrant community space and a groundbreaking advocacy organization. Their team spearheaded pioneering research and built a network of LGBTQ affirming health and business professionals. Due to political sensitivity, LGBTQ related research is very limited in China. When times were better, the center was able to work with forward-looking scholars to conduct large surveys, which have since been cited in countless media and academic articles. A few examples, such as the 2017 Chinese Transgender Population General Survey Report, Being LGBTI in China, a National Survey on Social Attitudes Towards Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Gender Expression, Awareness and Attitudes Towards Gender and Sexual Minorities, Among Psychiatry and Psychological Counseling Practitioners, written by the Beijing LGBT Center. So one thing that that tweet didn't cover is the use of a specific term. So this article points this out. Below is a rough translation of the center's above statement originally posted on their WeChat. Note that the center's use of the term, this term, which Google translates to force majeure, both an umbrella term and oblique manner with which to refer to a forcible circumstance outside one's control. And the statement reads as follows. Dear partners, Thank you for your attention and support. We are very sorry to inform you that due to force majeure, the Beijing Cultural Center has ceased operations today. If you are a monthly donor and want to know how, to do how donations will be handled in the future, and they give information on how to do that. So what did the center mean by force majeure? The reported reality is that nonprofit organizations supporting LGBTQ in China are unable to function without fear, as members often face police interrogations, personal property inspections, and intimidation, even if they leave the country. The government has increasingly accused such groups of collusion with foreign forces, emphasizing connections with countries like the U.S. and members of the Five Eyes Alliance. As a result, many activists face demands like the prohibition of events, social media account closures, and bans on regular social and dating activities. The public space for the LGBTQ community in China has been steadily shrinking. An advocacy group that served as a safe space for the LGBTQ community in Beijing has been shut down as part of a government pressure campaign against gay rights rights organizations. Police pressure on rights groups increased in the past few years. Police often invited LGBTQ plus groups to drink tea, a euphemism for unofficial meetings that police used to keep track of certain targets. That used to happen in public spaces, but started taking place in private spaces such as directly in front of activists' homes. Police also started taking activists to the police station for these teas, the activists said. When I was able to speak to Miss Wu about the tea drinking session, euphemism for police harassment, she sharply conveyed her sense of vulnerability due to the lack of interest in her stepping away from her popular Twitter account. And this is a statement from Naomi Wu. Literally the only thing that was keeping me online for the past years was they were worried it would make China look bad if they cracked down on me. Now that they know that I could be dead in a ditch tomorrow and no one would give a shit or say a word, I'm 1,000 times less safe here. This is really important to note. She was protected. And then public opinion changed. And she can't leave. Because her leaving would mean that she needs to just abandon her partner, who is a Uyghur Muslim. Naomi goes on. 
Having a real life Chinese person posting here who does not 100% endorse every part of their China good slash bad narrative makes it harder for them. And she's talking about the media here. Through Wu's lens, the nuances of her experiences become inconvenient. Wrinkles in the narrative Western media wishes to smooth out. One in which we prefer our subjects to be neatly framed silent victims whose stories can be manipulated without pushback. This is talking about the Western media. There's a reason that there's silence around this. Because it's not easy to package her in the way that they package other victims of authoritarian regimes despite the fact that she's very much in danger and has not been heard from in quite some time. No one knows where she is right now. The government disappeared her. So another statement by Wu. After years of doing this without anyone saying anything on June 30th, out of the blue, they sent plainclothes thugs to my house. Surprise, they were real cops. This event on June 30th was timed closely with events associated with a cybersecurity vulnerability report delivered to Tencent by researchers based at the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs, University of Toronto. The recent reporting, authored by Jeffrey Knockle, Zoe Reichert, and Mona Wang, addressed a serious encryption-related vulnerability in Tencent's popular Sogu keyboard software, affecting 455 million monthly users. Naomi Wu was trying to raise awareness for years especially as it relates to their usage alongside secure messaging apps. While Citizen Lab's report was published on August 9th, the vulnerability itself was initially reported back on May 31st per the disclosure timeline. A presumed lack of response led the researchers to attempt another disclosure method. A month later, on June 25th, Tencent dismissed the report as a low security risk and mocked it as not exciting. According to Citizen Lab's report, Tencent changed their mind less than a day later and nicely asked the researchers not to make the report public. Sorry, my previous reply was wrong. We are dealing with this vulnerability. Please do not make it public. Thank you very much for your report. The researchers replied, thank you for your update. We will publicly disclose the vulnerability after July 31st, 2023. As we can see, the vendor finally sat up and took official notice of this severe privacy affecting software bug on June 25th, only five days before Wu, who has previously tweeted about a vulnerability affecting the same Sogu software, was paid a visit by Chinese authorities. Wu explicitly drew this connection in my discussion with her. So this statement is by Naomi Wu again. Five days after Tencent admits to the IME vulnerability, the Chinese person in Shenzhen who originally publicized it suddenly gets dragged in by the cops and forced offline. None of them could read English to see my account does not even make China look bad. It was all Baidu. And Baidu is, um, if I remember correctly, Baidu is a Chinese word that basically means stupid Westerner. It was all Baidu fucking translate and demands why I was talking about signal on the keyboard. Her account concluded with an unsettling revel. Oh wait, Baidu equals China Twitter? What am I thinking of? I'm thinking of Bai Baizao. Oh yeah, my bad. Yeah, okay. That makes a lot more sense. Her account concluded with an unsettling revelation about the risk she would face if she were to continue tweeting. Having already received two strikes from the authorities, a third means that she could face a a years-long prison sentence. She had to sign and fingerprint a confession. So how could a security vulnerability in a Chinese mobile software play a part in Wu's recent warning from Chinese police? Wu herself had previously sent various public tweets obliquely warning about similar privacy-harming issues associated with the Sogu software in 2019, citing a 2015 report describing similar vulnerabilities. A particular concern she shared was that users of Sogu may decide to install Signal app to communicate, believing the app's safety profile to be broadly appropriate for many people. However, the eavesdropping and network fingerprinting risks associated with the use of a third-party keyboard such as Sogu take precedence over Signal's security profile. And as Naomi points out, this software is installed on 80 to 90% of Chinese computers and phones, creating a major issue. This means Signal app cannot stop an input method, such as Sogu, from recording keystrokes and sending them back to its developer as explicitly warned by Citizen Lab. China's national security law established in 2020 empowers the government to access surveillance data from Chinese tech companies without the need of a judicial process. This grants authorities the ability to obtain private information whenever deemed necessary. 
It is possible that Wu's tweets about the issues in the Sogu software, of which she was aware, may have caught the attention of Chinese authorities who were searching for related information on Western networks. Wu's theory that her tweets about these vulnerabilities could have led her to temporary detention and coercion now seems entirely possible. The article leaves off with another quote by Naomi. After eight years of daily tweeting, one of the loudest, most candid voices coming out of China has been deplatformed. Absolutely no one gives a shit. I could be dead in a ditch, but we aren't technically actually people. We're just signs for people like you in the West to wave at each other in their ideological war. That's what's going on right now with Naomi, where she finds herself in this predicament where she's not able to be neatly packaged and used as a weapon by Western media against China. But at the same time, she's very much in danger by the Chinese government for blowing the whistle about incredibly overreaching security problems. I didn't know anything about this. I was asked to cover this by one of her friends. And it honestly frustrates me that I haven't heard anything about this. There's a lot of different elements at play here. The fact that she's a lesbian, the fact that her partner is a Uyghur Muslim, the fact that she was blowing the whistle on like an overreaching security apparatus that the government had access to. The Western media frustrates me with how they cover China because people who don't fit neatly into the narrative that they want to push, they get ignored. Why isn't she a candidate for Western media attention? For a few reasons. I think the, the biggest one is that she's not willing to play solely into a narrative that China is bad, especially because she can't leave. She cannot leave China without abandoning her partner, who is part of a persecuted minority group that cannot leave the country. I'm mad. I want more people to be talking about this. Boss should talk about this. I can, I can try and get his attention. He probably would if I asked. Oh yeah, I forgot. He's chair hunting right now. He might be a bit too busy for that. But this could absolutely be a big news story if it gets enough eyes. And I'm just really shocked that it hasn't yet. I wish I had more to say, but there are two issues with this story. One is that a lot of the sources on what's going on are in Chinese, and they're hard for me as someone who does not speak Chinese to access. And the other issue is that people aren't talking about it. I can't find more information. So this Substack article that I found is literally all that's out there right now, ever since she disappeared. Good thread on our recent fight. Non-18+. plus. This is what Susan Wojcicki, I don't know how to pronounce the former YouTube CEO's last name. Woman who shoot lifestyle, not tech content. The moral of the story is don't fuck up and get born a girl and definitely don't fuck up and get born a gay one. That's... That's facts. Those are some words to live by. 14 male creators linked five women. The men do STEM, gaming, everything. The women do cooking, cosmetics, and lifestyle. You want to be a successful woman on YouTube? That's your niche. No tech for you. You think I'm joking? Not a single woman in the top 100 tech channels. And I'm not even close to the top 1,000 streamers. Sounds like she's pretty much screwed. She'd have to figure out a way to seek asylum. Going to the media and being openly anti-gov in China as a no-no, it's a, it's a big problem. And it's like, she could if she abandons her partner and her partner's family. Hey, when conservatives talk, talking about people being queer to further their careers because media fucking hates gay people. Oh yeah, no, no, absolutely not. It does not further your career to be queer. It does the opposite of furthering your career to be queer. There are so many expectations placed upon people that you cannot possibly meet. Being a woman in media is really hard. It's really hard. There, there's expectations on me and other women in media that you just don't see with men. I, I think you can even like point to Vosh as a good example. Not saying Vosh did anything wrong, but like up until he decided to get really into fashion, he wore like the same few outfits every stream and he had a chair that was just like falling apart. And there's just so many more expectation on women and women's appearance in media. Yeah, he started out straight coded and now he's like, now he's gay. This is what happens when you stream to a chat of transgender communists every day. Eventually the woke mind virus affects you.
It infects you. It gets straight down deep into your skin. There's a word in the Chinese trans community which means domestic violence recipient that covers half of the bios of Chinese trans kids on Twitter. That's so sad. The Naomi Wu stuff really upsets me because she's very well known in the on the maker space and anytime Western media covers her, they shit all over her or try to ask her comment on the Chinese government. It's it sucks because she's so much more than just a Chinese person who has issues with the Chinese government. Like she's a human being and people will try to take that away from her in order to use her as a weapon in an ideological war. I'm going to I'm going to do a request here. If you know any updates, like if you have any updates on the on this situation, please send me an email. It's clara at keffels.gg. I know that there are Chinese people in chat who have better access to the Chinese internet and follow these things a lot more closely than I do. And any if, anything that you would like to put forward, I'd really appreciate it. Also, here's her defending China in a good way. We're optimized for success within our system. There are shortcuts that allow these tools to be more easily applied to creative problem solving. Fortunately, it's hard to do that here without it becoming detrimental. Don't turn nice round pegs into square ones. I mean, I, there are ways that you can say that China is good without actually defending it. Like, yeah, they, they, they're good at making trains. They have very good rail system that doesn't, you know, you can say that without having to dismiss any of the terrible things that they do. It's not a black and white situation and you shouldn't, you shouldn't let it become a black and white situation because that's what governments want from you. They want you to think that China is either all good or all bad. They want you to think that America is either all good or all bad. It's easier to manipulate you if you allow them to take away your critical thinking abilities.